my purview yes. is all the aviation facilities, making sure they have their surface transportation planning needs met, uh, workforce development needs met, um, connecting them to academia, uh, FAA, and other portions within the industry here in the Metro. Another thing we are is a council of governments, which makes our organization unique. Um, most MPOs aren't council of governments, but with our, as a council of governments, we have two or three standing committees comprised of uh, 44 or more of our city governments in the metropolitan area. And that's mayors, city managers, um, city engineers, all the way at the highest levels within cities on uh, to do make decisions on anything from the transportation planning, a funding related perspective we do here in our region. Well, and just a foot stomp to be clear, it's it's yep. all modes of transportation that you're talking about, not just aviation and drones or advanced air mobility, uh, but even things like you know electric scooters. And I know you all have initiated recently a program for electric uh, automated driving system type vehicles uh, in the Metroplex area. So you've got a lot of things on your plate. Let's talk about your uh, UAS integration work because uh, I know we talked a little bit about this on Clubhouse, but again, I'm, I'm assuming some people maybe weren't there. Um, you know, we had Maggie Schuster uh, on yep. on our legacy podcast, which was uh, the drones at dawn, which was every Monday, you know, with inner drone. And, uh, you know, she told us that you all started like 25 people in a room. Uh, you know, this idea of, boy, you know, you're getting phone calls from the airport, the drones are interfering. Uh, you know, obviously the Dallas airport is such a huge, Dallas Fort Worth is such a huge uh, airport. And yep. that's kind of how how your integration team and, and all the different things that you've now created was kind of born. Um, to, so how big is it now is my first yep. question. Yeah, so we're about probably more than 400 folks, uh, 175 or 180 plus organizations. I got to do a recount now, um, end of year recount on folks, but um, we've grown exponentially. And um, we've been able to get a catchment area of folks outside the country now where we have normal presentations from folks in New Zealand, Australia, Europe. Um, and we're going to probably get some folks from Asia to present in 2022. So we've been really growing uh, in terms of the task force in our North Texas UAS safety and integration initiative. Well, um, you have grown so large, not only in, in the different kinds of people and the numbers, but also like in, I'll call it your working groups or subgroups of that overarching effort. Um, you know, because when we talked about, uh, you know, your work in Texas, I kind of pitched it on, on social media as, hey, learn about how to do public-private partnerships. I mean, if, if anybody's a model for that, Ernest, it's you and what you're doing with the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Tell us about, I think you're up to five working groups or subgroups, what yep. those are, and uh, and then we'll get a little bit into kind of how folks have, uh, how, how people can link into them. Yeah, and I'll back up, give a slight bit of background for folks who weren't on the clubhouse call. So we created the North Texas UAS Safety and Integration Initiative. Uh, mainly the overall goal was to mitigate reckless drone flights in and around our airports. Those folks had issues with uh, drones landing on runways and on taxiways, and there wasn't a legal recourse that they had. So we, we put together the initiative to start to, to fill in the gaps with that industry's uh, issues with integrating, getting recreational pilots trained and educated on what to do and where to fly in the Metroplex, et cetera. So when we did that, um, I realized that the issue with integrating drone technology into a metropolitan area like ours is large, a lot of different stakeholders needed to be collaborated, need to be coordinated and focused, and it needed to be holistic, meaning there wasn't just one issue with integrating drone technology. It wasn't just an issue of technology or safety, but there were dozens of issues, uh, dozens of high level issues with integrating the technology. So I created the working groups. Um, to try to get some folks with the industry knowledge on how to solve those issues in, a, in the room together and help us uh, develop the plans to go forward with solving those issues first. So there's five. There's our public, uh, our education public awareness working group. That's primarily focused on educating recreational pilots on how to fly, where to get training, um, drone laws, et cetera. Also educating those commercial pilots on the same type of things, 
And that's um, Ernest, that's the one that uh, Maggie's involved in, right? And yep. your know before you fly your drone workshop Workshops. monthly on a Saturday, on Saturday, like usually the yep. first Saturday of the month that anybody can dial into for free. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, and that, and that, that uh, know before you fly your drone workshop was the first program we created underneath that working group uh, to generally just a general education program that's free. It's open to the public, open to everyone. To, helping to bridge the gap between general knowledge, airmanship, and our recreational pilots and upcoming and, and, and new professional pilots in our region. Another thing that, that that group is tasked with is the public awareness and the marketing on uh, on the drone integration. And, and folks, drone, on my, my side, when I think of drones, I think of everything from the small drones, small UAS, all the way up to air taxi, air cargo, uh, air medical use, and all that jazz. So. When I say drones, I'm not just talking about the small, just the SUASs. I'm thinking of everything. Right, right. So that industry had an issue with public awareness. When I started, only thing when I started engaging with industry, only thing I'd seen drones used for were in a military capacity to take right. out terrorists, except and things of that nature. And I knew me as an aviator, if I had that that uh, idea of drone technology, the layman will have a, an extreme version of that, right? So yeah. we needed to we need to attack that, market to those folks, let them know what drones will be used for in a metropolitan area like ours, what we won't allow, allow drones to be used for, how they can get involved in the industry, how they can take advantage of the opportunity. And Maggie is one of those folks who came in really as a layman um, in the beginning where we started. Now she's an expert, but she saw through the stuff we were doing, the opportunity inherent or coming with this industry. And that's the stuff we do in that first working group, get the opportunities out there. Yeah, it's inc it's incredible. It's global, and you know, just just a, a, another exemplar of of the amazing things you all are doing. So that's Group One. Yep. Tell, tell us about some that's of the other group ones. So, and I'll try to breeze through these fast. We have our legislation and policy working group where we primarily focus on legislation. So, another thing that happened to us uh, before we even started the initiative was we were working on a model ordinance to get our cities to regulate where recreational drones took off and landed in the metro. Then the state of Texas came in and outlawed cities from creating regional or local ordinance around drone technology. Obviously, an attempt to, to re remove a preemptive, uh, preemptive legislation out there, which is fine. But because of that, we realized there's a need now to be collaborative, coordinate on comments with laws, have a, a, a center of gravity where industry can come and voice their concerns with laws, um, get the information so they can lobby effectively to legislators down in Austin, et cetera. That's what we do in that legislative uh, and policy working group. Well, that, we you know, that, Ernest, that one's yeah. so hugely important because, you know, Texas says you know, they've had some pretty good, I'd say, positive pro-drone laws. You know, I, I know there's one specifically that allows drones to support critical infrastructure. It's probably one of the few laws on the books in the country that very proactively says, here is an ideal use for drones. Drones are permitted around critical infrastructure because I, there is some friction there in other states. Um, you know, I know there was like a, let's call it an avigation or, you know, sky toll in mm -hmm. the sky type legislation that was proposed there in Texas. And I know uh, on the drone service providers side, that was like, whoa, what is happening out there in Texas? Yep. And and uh, so I, I think what you're doing with that positive engagement and having those conversations, you know, you and I'm pre presuming AUVSI Lone Star and, and folks like Adrian Doko and that group and, and probably the Drone Service Providers Alliance and others educating folks on this is why this would be a good law or this is why this would be a bad idea um, is really huge to have that kind of public to public communication, you know, when you think of the different branches of government. Um, so good, good on you for that initiative, because it's hard to bust, you know, to have those connections and, and kind of bust in the door to have that kind of influence and, and to educate people well, including our own government workers, like our Congress people, our legislators. Um, so good on you for that. That's hugely important. Um, okay, so we got groups one, two, what are, what's three, yep. four, and five? So then there was our training, our training and workforce development working group. And that's where we focus primarily on training and that's uh, trying to get credentialed and standardized training at all levels. That's a grade school all the way up to um, through middle, high, 
uh, a two-year college, four-year degree programs, and even those professional degree programs. We actually got established the first of its kind from the Department of Labor and apprenticeship program for drone, a professional drone pilot here at one of our two-year universities where we, we paid folks to become professional drone pilots. We trained them over an eight-month period in a stringent apprenticeship program and um, one of the first of its kind programs. So that's the type of stuff we're doing in that. And another thing is the workforce development where we're tying in the, the, the drone manufacturers to the academic institutions to make sure that they are teaching the curriculum that is needed to fulfill the role in those jobs that are upcoming in that industry in our, in our region. And yeah. in our region, that industry is growing tr uh, exponentially on the manufacturing side. Well, I know, I know Texas, what, what do you have over 600 aerospace and defense companies or something to that tune? Yep. Uh, you know, obviously I'm in Colorado. I think you know that many of my viewers know that, um, you know, I, I believe Colorado is the number one aerospace and defense uh, state in the country, but when it comes to drones, maybe not so much like satellites and space obviously are huge here in Colorado. Uh, you know, so we're hoping to change that next year, but we'll talk about 2022 here in a minute. So you got the training initiative number three. Tell us about four and five. So the fourth is just our general integration working group. And it's the working group I put together. Initially, was the goal was to get our cities and other folks in our corporations thinking about integrating the technology and what they needed in place to integrate the technology. So we bring in subject matter experts, airspace folks, to educate those folks, um, we talk about um, uh, integration pilots. So we helped get established a, a UAS and uh, AAM testing zone out of Mineral Wells, Texas. Um, we've been helping now, is that folks the one with NASA or no? That's a different initiative. No, that's a those are just different initiatives. Okay, so, so tell tell us about this testing zone that you've created. So the, the city of Mineral Wells has uh, the Mineral Wells Innovation Zone. That's out in the city of Mineral Wells where they're testing small drones and large uh, AAM drones out there. Um, as well as we have another testing area, Hillwood Alliance in their mobility innovation zone. They do air cargo, large air cargo airport, one of the largest air cargo airports in the country, 11,000 foot runways, two of them, where they're doing, they're doing automated ground related cargo movement and they're looking at doing automated air stuff. So they're doing air. They're doing, they're testing a lot of drone applications in their testing area up there too. So we help with those folks get that stuff established and, and help them network with industry. Um, we've, all, we've also, as a part of that integration working group, established a pilot in the city of Arlington. So we have our advanced air mobility pilot in the Arlington Entertainment District, where we're looking to demonstrate and establish beyond visual line of sight um, operations in a, a, a high, air, high impact area. A um, lot of commercial endeavors, a lot of stuff going on, Cowboy Stadium, Six Flags, a lot of stuff in that area that we're, we're looking to impact. Wow, that's, that's spectacular. Now, just get me straight because I know you've got so many things. Is mm -hmm. this general integration group, this one, number four that we're talking about, is that yep. different than the monthly invites I get for those meetings? Okay, yep. well, let's pause that so, then and we'll talk about that separately. Yep. Uh, so... You have another, you, a more recent group you formed, I believe, number five. Tell us about that. Yeah, and that one's called, for lack of a better word, I've called it the Community Integration Working Group. I probably need to find a better one. But this is a group that I've put aside specific just with cities. So the cities, because there's no vendors, no academic institutions, nobody else in this group, just the cities where they can talk about their in integration walls, um, collaborate, co collaborate on uh, funding, um, best cases, use strategies, um, work on business cases, things of that nature, uh, do's and don'ts, just a forum where cities can come together, discuss integrating drone technology together. And that's our community integration working group. Where, and we use that group to educate them on all kinds of things. So we had a, a public safety seminar, we had an AAM seminar for those folks. Um, we're gonna do an academic one. We're just gonna continue to educate those folks and get them up, up and running. Uh, what's coming in that that industry? Well, I I love how you were really focused on educating every kind of stakeholder you can possibly imagine, from you know you you mentioned academia to the general public to these kind of local government officials that may not know that hey this is a thing it's coming to a town near you you might want to have a clue. <laughs> I mean yeah. that's that's awesome. So. 
Uh, I mentioned before we get to these other monthly meetings, which are hugely important because when you think of public-private partnerships, you've got a lot of people dialing in on a monthly basis to like your North Central Texas Council of Governments, which I find to be really interesting globally, nationally. Okay, let's pause that for a second. Let's talk about this NASA AAM opportunity that you all landed this year. So tell us yep. a little bit about that and how it fits into your larger integration efforts. Yeah, so we we competed. Um, we we're fortunate to win in uh, March or February of last year. A partnership with NASA is called Community Integration or Community Planning and Integration Annex, where NASA and there's four other regions around the country. We're all working on a best cases. Uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, a best case uh, white paper on how cities can integrate the technology, and they're going to be working with all of our regions to see what we're doing, combine all of our efforts. On the do's and don'ts to create a template for other folks to use uh, uh, down the line. So we've had working groups throughout the or workshops throughout the year, brainstorming events and things of that nature. And we have our last one, I think, in February of 2022. Where wow. then after that, those folks will create a guidebook and we'll be publishing it for the general public soon as soon after. Well, that's amazing. And I, I know you were like one of maybe five. One of five. Uh, Dates that that got selected for that, so good on you. Um, let's let's pivot for a second and talk about, I guess, the larger Council of Governments monthly meetings that you all host. Mm -hmm. And drones and advanced air mobility are a real big focus of that uh, because of your leadership. Tell us what those are, who's dialing in, and how other people can get connected. So let me back up. Um, as a part of our North Central or North Texas Safety and Integration Initiative, we have multiple programs. One is our, our five working groups that I just mentioned. Yeah. Um, another would be our public safety unmanned response team and committee. So that's our public safety folks, 45 organizations. They do a lot, and we'll probably talk about that later. And then, um, but our main thing is our North Texas UAS Safety and Integration Task Force. That's our main stakeholder group and forum. That's the main way that uh, folks from outside of our region and in region can come and collaborate and network with us. Um, and that's the forum I stood up to figure out who's who in the, in the region to see how we can solve the problem. So that's the main group that Maggie showed up to where we started with 20 folks in a room and grew to, to almost 500 was the task force. And we meet monthly. I'll have guest speakers from around the world speaking on specific topics and, and and I try to be uh, uh, di uh, diplomatic with the topics, meaning I'll, I'll have a, 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 an agenda with AAM topics or an, alongside a university research topic, alongside a, uh, a, a small mom and pop uh, museum opening. I put all of them on the same agenda and you might, and I, I, don't, I don't play favorites for where they're placed. I give them all the same attention and focus because what I realized is every sector, every one of those folks has a business case, all of them, all of all of them represent opportunity, and all of them have a, a stake in the industry and in making sure it's integrated safely. And I, I get those invites, Ernest, and I know, like, and I've dialed in. In fact, I was honored to speak at the beginning of this year after the remote ID came out for your January meeting. Uh, my memory is there was like over 300 people signed in, and like I said, it wasn't just Texas, it wasn't just even the United States. It was global uh, participation, which. I think is really significant. Uh, so this UAS task force, integration task force is the larger umbrella. You've got these five sub working groups. You've got this NASA thing going on with advanced air mobility, all of these other projects that we just talked about. Tell us a little bit about the PCERT or the public safety uh, uh, re response team group that you created because that's, that's like a really specialized niche. You know, drone responders is out there. You know, when you think about community acceptance and public acceptance to things that you're also focused on as part of your working groups, a large, you know, uh, portion of the public, they see what public safety is doing with drones and that can have a really significant impact on public perception and community acceptance. So what is the PCERT and, and what's going on with that? Well, first of all, I'm not going to take credit. I did not create the PCERT group. They they were in existence probably before I even moved to Texas. All I did was fold them into what we were doing. So they awesome. already existed. So yeah. that was that was created by what I learned when I got down here. There's the pedigree of 
law enforcement and public safety's use of drones is immense. A lot of those folks are grandfathers. We call them the forefathers within that industry, the first of its kind. They stood up programs. Um, um, and you look at places like city of Arlington, um, the city of uh, uh, Mansfield, they had programs for more than a decade now. So what they decided, what they did, and they, similar to what I, um, on, what I started with the task force, they realized that most of these law enforcement agencies, they were working in silos in terms of getting their programs. And, it, and, it, and when you work in a silo, in particular in law enforcement, and you try to get more funding from, from your mayor, uh, you're, you're beating your head against the wall if you don't have any uh, folks who can come in and say how it worked in the past, how it was useful to the city. So they wanted to put together collaborative efforts with these law enforcement agencies, in particular the ones who were working on establishing these programs initially. And then they realized it, it made a lot of sense for more public safety, each city in, 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 in the region to have public safety's use of drone. Because when it's time to coordinate for large scale efforts, it's good to have folks in and know in the city that can operate efficiently. Well, and you need they, the, you absolutely need interoperability. I mean, that's what's the whole in this national response framework is about, right? Like, yep. because you, most disasters, they don't stay within one locality. And even if they do, it's sometimes you, you need to call in help from elsewhere, even cross state borders, right? So really, really awesome that that, that group started, number one, yep. and number two, that they were smart enough and you were smart enough to link up together uh, because, you know, like you said, there's limited dollars and, you know, mm -hmm. to the extent that everybody's collaborating and like planning together, which is really at the, at the heart of what you do, uh, that's, that's significant. Um, yeah. So that, that's good, good on you for that as well. Um, I yeah. want to transition for a second, Ernest, because this okay. is a best of 2021. By the way, I do want to do a quick shout out to Sage Tech Avionics, our month sponsor, uh, without whom this would, you know, with, with this would not be possible. Uh, you know, you, a lot of your efforts are for safety and what Sage Tech is doing with uh, on the military side with uh, identify friend or foe transponders and on the civilian side now with detect and avoid uh, capabilities is really all about safety and security. Uh, for our troops and the folks here in the United States and globally, uh, you know, in the airspace and on the ground. So thanks again, Sage Tech. Um, I want to pivot for a second and talk a little bit about uh, what you're, you've accomplished so much. Um, what do you, what do you see happening in 2022? You said the NASA project's going to end. You're putting together a guidebook with up these other states for NASA. Uh, what else is on the horizon for you, for the North Central Count Texas Council of Governments and all this drone and AAM stuff you're doing? Well, what I'm really excited about is we've been doing all of this without funding, um, without much funding allocated. We've been self-funding a majority of our efforts, or all of our efforts to date. So what we're excited about is it's the federal money that's coming down, particularly the infrastructure bill. Um, there's some earmark for advanced air mobility pilot studies or, or emerging technology pilot studies that we're excited to go after because what we've been missing is the opportunity to have some funding, probably get some funding studies to see feasibility on integrating some of the technology we're looking to do. Um, so that's in 2022, it's competing for funds. Um, we also, and I manage an aviation education initiative too. So. Uh, one of the things in my purview is educating folks on aviation careers around the Metroplex and around the country now, getting kids interested and acclimated to aviation careers, and that's inclusive of the drone stuff. So I'm looking to get funding to increase those efforts and improve on those efforts as well. Well, you know, that's great because uh, funding is an issue, or, you know, on that note, because you're so, you are such a, a leader in the area of public-private partnerships, if you're willing to share, I'm curious whether or not you, you said you've been self-funding. I mean, we're talking mm -hmm. government, you know, the North Central Texas Council of Governments. Um, have you seen, have you gotten some help from the private sector? You know, all of these companies that are dialing into your monthly, really, that's interesting to me because. We tried it. We tried a, um, uh, uh, we actually had a sponsorship uh, component with our Know Before You Fly Your Drone workshops. Yeah that we were trying to raise funds via that mechanism, but it's tough for folks. You know, a lot of folks don't have a lot of money laying around yep. in this industry because it's emerging to do any, any of that type of stuff. 
which interesting, is interesting. Interesting. We can talk offline. I mean, I I did a lot of that with the United States Air Force, you know, and through nonprofits, like especially with the Air Force Academy, and uh, a lot of that was capital campaigns, you know, for building, uh, literally building buildings, um, things of that nature. But um, you'd be surprised. Uh, you just have to kind of structure it, but. Yeah, funding is tight for everybody, you know, looking forward to seeing how that shakes out. We have seen a ton of uh, capital infusion into the advanced air mobility markets this this past year, but, you know, and then we saw some other weird things, you know, like, hey, you know, this, this company is going to go this route for certification or, you know, and, and things like that. So, um, you know, at, at the end of the day, how it's all going to play out is still much to be determined. And I think on the regulatory front, we're still a little bit standing by, you know, I think the technology's really moved forward leaps and bounds and uh, people are just kind of chomping at the bit to have that authority to do things. Uh, exciting news, by the way, Ernest, today, I did see my very dear friend, Jackie Jumovic uh, out at, in Australia, Hover UAV. She works with Percepto uh, CASA, which is their civil uh, aviation authority out there in Australia, just approved BV loss, outright BV loss for Percepto uh, and Jackie's nice. uh BV Loss Hub group of her company help them obtain those approvals. So that's super cool, right? To see that happening in Australia, this announcement today, uh, seeing so many things in Europe with the Golf 2.0 trials and all that integration for unmanned traffic management or use space. Um, I'm looking forward to the day soon in the United States where we're seeing much more of that regularly. And I'm really looking forward to this beyond visual line of sight, you know, aviation rulemaking committee and, you know, what those recommendations are. And are we going to see some rulemaking? You know, it'll be really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we are we are getting super short on time, but, you know, this is a best of 2021 episode. So I do want to pick your brain on, you know, just kind of stepping outside of your specific role and being, you know, an advocate and a leader in this industry, and I say this being drone, small, up to large, advanced air mobility, you know, EV tall and other aircraft. Um, what would you say was kind of the best development in the industry, the industry in 2021? Oh. The best development, Andy. Man, so many things happened this year, right? I mean, I think there's yeah. been a lot of great things. And I can only speak from my perspective. Because, yeah, that's it. And it's, it's important because I'm not a drone. I'm not in the industry. I think I'm an advocate and I'm doing a lot of work now in the industry, but it's hard for me to explain it. But I'm really not. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the aviation industry. So for me, it's just the funding. It's, that's what we've really been waiting on. And, and what I do see is happening um, here in the state of Texas, we just created, Texas just created their Urban Air Mobility co uh, Council. They hadn't been speaking about urban air mobility or drone integration at on the state level here in, in Texas for years. So that's another thing. But what that, I think, is going to come, some state funding for folks here in, in, to do stuff with. So from my perspective, it's just the funding, the allocation. I could start seeing the green at the end of the tunnel that will allow us to move forward on some of the stuff because our cities just can't afford it to do yeah. it on their own. Well, our cities are even our law enforcement, right? So yeah. what I love about what you're doing, you know, when you think about the state of the states, and I know that's kind of another sub theme to this particular episode, you know, you look at North Dakota and, you know, I wrote a piece in Forbes.com about them and I went up there, right, for that UAS summit and expo. And, and I mean, it's palpable, like the, the, energy was incredible like from the senators to Northrop Grumman, General Atomics, these big defense aerospace and defense companies, University of North Dakota under the leadership of you know Brigadier General Air Force retired Andy Armacost and you know industry writ large you know just rocking it out with Vantas right and their new op center at, at Grand Sky they had a leg up like let's let's call it what it is right all of those oh, yeah. all of those states all of those groups that had the original test sites in the Obama era, and then got into the IPP, the Integration Pilot Program, with the FAA, which was also a congressional mandate, uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, the Beyond Program, you know, they have a leg up. You know, what's really cool about Texas, even though you have test sites, right, is that you were never really part of that formal, like, kind of favored son and daughter crowd, if you will, for that, but yet y'all have rocked it, and 
you know, you really, especially at the government level, it's so great to hear what you're saying, Ernest, that people at the state are caring, that they're, they're creating UAM working groups. So everybody out there that's listening, if you want to know how to do this right, you don't, you don't just sit back and say, oh, well, we never got the test site, right? Or, oh, we, ne you know, the test site designation officially from Congress or the FAA, or we're not part of the, I it doesn't matter because states, including Colorado, we have test sites, like we have amazing companies. So like, look at what Ernest is doing. Look at what Texas is doing. This is why, in my humble opinion, when I think about the 2021 I'm putting Texas way up there on that leaderboard because, um, you know, I'm I'm proud of what you're doing. I'm frankly envious of what you're doing. Uh, sitting where I sit in Colorado as president and CEO of UAS Colorado, the state's only nonprofit business league for the unmanned aircraft system ecosystem. Um, you know, we we we're not where you are, and uh, so I'm telling you, 2022, we're going to give you a run for your money, buddy. I'm going to take your template and go with it because uh, it. that, and everybody should, because we all know drones are the future, and so is advanced air mobility. And if our departments of transportation, our aviation folks, like where you came from, Ernest, general aviation, if they're not taking this seriously and they're looking at drones as a, as kind of a an annoyance because occasionally they might, you know, enter a flight line and cause some shutdowns. They're looking at it wrong because as the Navy says, the, the tide raises all ships. And that is the case when we're talking about aviation. This could be a seamless network, bringing tons of money and economic opportunities to the state. And uh, you guys are gonna be at the front of the line because you're already ahead. And so, so good on you. Um, we're kind of out of Schlitz here. I know we started late and I apologize for that, Ernest. It no is problem. such a privilege to always talk to you. Um, I'm so looking forward next year. You know, one of the things as I think about 2022, as we head into the holidays and the new year is uh, hopefully, you know, we're, we're kind of coming out of this, of this COVID fog. I mean, I know it's still lingering and there's, but you know, in-person conferences and the ability to, to get together with people and meet people like you, Ernest, in person. Uh, I got to see Adrian this year. That was so cool. And so many people. Um, that was kind of a big highlight for me personally and professionally this year. Um, so speaking of which, uh, for everybody out there, uh, I want to announce a couple of things tomorrow on Clubhouse, right? Ernest, please join us again if you have the time. Uh, I've invited so many industry leaders to join us on Clubhouse tomorrow at 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I mean, we're talking, you know, Iris Automation, Sage Tech Avionics, uh, Zio Air, and my good friend, Bronwyn uh, Morgan, who's absolutely incredible. Um, Luke Fox from White Fox Defense. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Uh, you know, there's at least 16 industry leaders I've invited, and I hope others just join in because it's going to be all about what's, what happened this year, what can we expect for next year. Super excited. And by the way, that same crowd, a lot of those people are going to be on a crazy podcast next week. It's, it's pre-taped, but it's great stuff, so join us next week as well. Um, special announcement, breaking news. As Ernest and I were talking here, uh, we're actually missing uh, the FAA versus uh, Race Day Clause versus FAA oral arguments in that lawsuit. Um, my producer, Mike, and I are going to be going live on Twitter spaces tonight uh, with a handful of folks to kind of do the play-by-play -play readout. That's going to be on demand also on YouTube, uh, those arguments. So uh, watch them before you dial in, uh, 5 p.m. Eastern tonight, Twitter spaces. Follow me there, and uh, it's going to be pretty cool. So um, that's all she wrote. We are a little over. We're a little short, all of that. Uh, sorry, Ernest. Happy holidays to you. Uh, yeah, you too everything you've done, not just for Texas, but for the industry this year, and really looking forward to seeing what you do in 2022. Uh, happy holidays. Happy New Year. Likewise. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you. Out here, everybody.